On an evening in March of 2007, a volunteer firefighter responded to a call at an apartment complex in Harris County, Texas. Several residents had phoned 911, saying that they were worried because they had seen smoke coming from one of their neighbor's units. After arriving at the apartment, the firefighter, along with a police deputy, were let in by the man that lived there. The man said that he wasn't in any danger. He had been in the middle of making dinner on his patio, and he was pretty sure this is what the callers had seen. For safety reasons, the firefighter and the officer had a quick look around, but they didn't see anything of serious concern. They did spot something a little unusual in one of the rooms as they were leaving, but pretty much everything lined up with what the man had told them. This whole situation was chalked up to a simple misunderstanding. Until, about a week later, that's when some new information would completely change the context of everything that the firefighter and deputy had witnessed that day. By far the worst part, though, would be when they learned what they had really seen in that room on their way out. The spring of 2007 was an exciting time in the life of 19-year-old Tanisha Stewart. She was a student at her dream college, had a large circle of family and friends, and just generally seemed like she was on the right path towards a bright future. Tanisha had grown up in the northern suburbs of Houston, Texas, where she was known from an early age for her outgoing personality, her great sense of humor, and her warm smile. According to those close to her, she made friends easily and had this magnetic charm, something that was amplified by the fact that she was never afraid to be herself. Tanisha attended and graduated from Chester W. Nimitz Senior High, a school that is known for having several professional athletes amongst its alumni. This includes MLB player Michael Bourne, WNBA player and Olympian Brittany Griner, and several NFL players, two of whom were Tanisha's own uncles, Aaron and Jason Glenn. While athletics might have run in the family, that wasn't Tanisha's thing. In fact, the closest she got to organized sports in high school was being the manager of the basketball team. As her sister Gayla put it, this was, quote, simply because she didn't like to sweat. She was always prim and proper, neat and put together. Despite this, Tanisha did follow in her uncle's footsteps in one way. After finishing high school, she went on to attend Texas A&M University. Of course, she went the academic route. She had graduated in the top 10% of her high school class, received multiple scholarships towards her education, and dreamed of becoming an engineer. When Tanisha's freshman year started in the fall of 2006, she was both incredibly excited and incredibly nervous to go off to college. Like for many people her age, it was her first real taste of independence, and she didn't know what to expect. It turned out that Denisha had nothing to worry about, though. She quickly embraced the traditions of Texas A&M and became a proud Aggie, the nickname given to students there. According to her roommate, Lindsay Steichen, Tanisha loved saying howdy to people she passed on campus and regularly attended the elaborate pep rallies for the football team known as Midnight Yell. She also got involved in a bunch of different school organizations, such as the Excel Leadership Program and the National Society of Black Engineers. It was no surprise to anyone, therefore, that when March rolled around a few months later, Tanisha was ready to make the most of another college tradition, spring break. She had her vacation all planned out in her head. She would spend a couple of nights with family before heading out and catching up with friends all over the Houston area. Towards the end of the week, if she had time, she was planning on going down to South Padre Island, an extremely popular destination for a lot of college students during spring break. The highlight of the break by far, though, was going to be a Beyonce concert that was being held at Reliant Stadium on the Thursday, March 15th. Tanisha and a bunch of her friends had bought tickets, and they were all really looking forward to it. Now, everyone in Tanisha's life knew how hyped she was for this concert. She couldn't stop talking about it. She had arranged to borrow the car from her mom to get there. It was very important to her. That's why it was extremely concerning when Tanisha just never showed up. On March 19th, 2007, Harris County Police received a call from Tanisha's mother, Gail Shields. She stated that no one had seen or heard from her daughter in several days. They had no idea where she was, 
they were unable to contact her, and they were scared that something might have happened to her. Gail explained that the last time anyone had spoken to Tanisha was four days earlier. The evening before that, she had gone to an apartment where her friend Lois lived, and she and a whole group of their friends spent the night hanging out. Tanisha had left sometime in the early morning hours of March 15th. Initially, Gail said that she and the rest of the family weren't all that worried when they didn't hear from Tanisha. They knew that she was busy catching up with a lot of her friends, and that she planned to bounce around and spend the night at a couple of their places before they'd see her again. What really alarmed them, though, was when they started hearing from some of Tanisha's friends, who didn't seem to know where she was either. They said that not only was Tanisha not with them, she had missed that Beyoncé concert that all of them had been talking about for ages. By the time that Gail received this information, a day or two had already passed. She and other loved ones had then gone looking for Tanisha. They tried people she knew, local hospitals, everywhere they could think of, but they had ultimately come up empty. Before I go any further here, I should say that there are some discrepancies concerning the reporting around the timeline here. While it's definitely clear that there was a delay between when Tanisha vanished and when her family became aware, they later claimed that they notified police about her disappearance prior to March 19th, when most sources state that a missing persons investigation was finally launched. In interviews we came across, Tanisha's sister Gayla stated that it didn't seem like police were taking the situation very seriously, and that this explains why the case didn't officially start until the 19th. It's also apparently the reason they reached out for help to a community activist named Quanell X. Now, Quanell X is quite a character in his own right, and we don't have time to dig into his full story here. But suffice it to say, he had a complicated relationship with the Harris County and Houston Police Departments. He was often at odds with them and had led protests against them, but he would also sometimes act as an intermediary between authorities and suspects, negotiating peaceful surrenders to what could have otherwise been violent situations. The main thing that Quan X was known for, though, was drumming up publicity, particularly around cases that involved the black community. When Tanisha's loved ones reached out to Quanell X, he agreed to do what he could. Of course, the family also had something else going for them. As I mentioned before, two of Tanisha's uncles were NFL players. The combined efforts of this outreach meant that the case quickly captured public attention. Along with it came mass amounts of speculation. Within just a couple of days, rumors had spread that Tanisha had been kidnapped by a stranger, that there had been some kind of accident, or that she had even run away to start a new life. Police, meanwhile, were beginning to focus their attention in a different direction, specifically on the idea that Tanisha's disappearance could be the work of someone intimately involved in her life. After an official missing persons investigation was launched, police spoke to Tanisha Stewart's friends and family members in the hopes of getting some more information about her. They also wanted to know if they had suspicions about anyone that she was close to. It turned out that they did, particularly when it came to the men in her life. Being the bright, social, and beautiful person that she was, Tanisha had attracted her fair share of romantic attention. She had had a few different serious relationships, and loved ones said that pretty much all of these people were still in the picture to one degree or another. According to them, Tanisha really treasured the deep connection she made, so even after she was no longer romantically involved with someone, she liked to try and remain friends. As you might imagine, though, this had a tendency to make things complicated. One of the first names to be brought up was Tanisha's ex-boyfriend, Timothy. Tanisha and Timothy had met when they were both working at a local pizza hut. At the time, Tanisha was 16, and it was her part-time job while she was in high school. Timothy was 24 and was working as a delivery driver. Understandably, Tanisha's family initially had reservations about the relationship, especially because of the big age gap between them. But as they got to know Timothy, they started to feel more at ease. He was smart, had a knack for computers, and came from a good family who were well known in the area. He was also the father of a young girl. He and Tanisha had ended up dating for about two years, but family members said that they had split up when she went away to college. The reason Timothy's name came up 
was because according to Tanisha's friends, he was one of the final people to see her before she went missing. He had actually picked her up from Lois's place early on March 15th. So again, that same day that she was last heard from. Police headed over to Timothy's home and asked him about all of this. He said that, yeah, he had picked up Tanisha from her friend's place that morning, sometime around 4 a.m. Afterwards, they had returned to his place for a few hours, but he said that eventually she had left. When investigators asked a few more questions about this, Timothy admitted that Tanisha had stormed off because of an argument. He said that he had been pestering her about her new relationship with a guy at school and she got upset with him. He said he felt bad about it, but he really wasn't sure where she had gone after that. Detectives asked to have a look around, and Timothy was more than cooperative. He agreed to a search of his home and his car, but nothing of interest was really found. As a result, for the time being, police decided to move on. While this didn't provide much in the way of answers, something that Timothy said did catch the attention of authorities. The new boyfriend he had mentioned was actually someone else who they had heard about a couple of different times now. This new boyfriend was named Mark, and as I said, Tanisha met him while at college. The relationship between them was fairly recent. They had only been dating for a couple of months at the time of the disappearance. Those who had met Mark, or who had heard Tanisha talk about him, had pretty much only heard good things. You know, he was calm, he was nice, they made each other laugh, that kind of stuff. But at the same time, because all of this was so recent, nobody in Tanisha's life really knew Mark all that well. This alone made him a person of interest. However, there was something else that concerned detectives as well. You see, Mark was one of the people that was with Tanisha when she was hanging out with her friends at Lois's apartment between March 14th and 15th. And according to them, he was supposed to be going to that Beyonce concert. That was the thing, though. No one had seen Mark since the morning of the 15th, either. Police were able to get his phone number, and they tried calling him several times, but they didn't receive any answer. Obviously, this was pretty suspicious. Mark had seemingly vanished more or less at the same time as Tanisha, so investigators had to consider the possibility that this was connected. Still, all they could do for the moment was continue trying to track him down. At the same time, there were two other names that had come up that police decided they needed to look into. The first person was another one of Tanisha's ex-boyfriends, a man named Curtis. Tanisha and Curtis had also met in high school, though he was much closer to her in age. Tanisha's family explained that for both of them, it was kind of their first real relationship. You know, they had flirted in class, gotten to know each other, and had ended up going to homecoming together. As with many stories of young first love, though, it didn't last. They were on and off again for a while, but eventually they broke things off for good. Tanisha's family told police that Curtis was a really sweet guy, but he had been really heartbroken by the situation, especially when Tanisha later started seeing Timothy. Since they were now at the point of trying to consider all possibilities, they had to wonder, had Curtis maybe been harboring some jealousy or resentment even a few years later? The last name that came up was put forward by some of Tanisha's friends. It was her stepfather, Preston Shields. Tanisha's parents had split up when she was pretty young, and her mom, Gail, had ended up marrying Preston. Because of this, Preston had essentially raised her, though friends said that he and Tanisha didn't have the best relationship. They told authorities that Tanisha would often complain about her stepdad, saying that he was controlling and that she didn't like living under his rules. They frequently had arguments that would end in tears, and some said that Tanisha had gone as far as to say that she was afraid of being alone with him. Detectives looked into both of these potential leads, but they were quickly satisfied that neither Curtis nor Preston had anything to do with Tanisha's disappearance. It turned out that Curtis hadn't really seen or spoken with her in a while before she went missing, and family members said that there was no way Preston would have ever done anything to harm her. On top of this, both men had solid alibis for the time around when she was last seen. Just when it looked like authorities had hit a dead end, they finally got an update that they had been waiting for. Mark had been found. He was on South Padre Island. When Mark agreed to come in for an interview, he was immediately questioned about this. Police asked him, you know, like, weren't you supposed to be going there with Tanisha? Also, what happened to the Beyonce concert? 
Mark said that, yeah, all of that was true, but he was just as confused as everyone else. He claimed that he had been calling Tanisha over and over again the past few days, but that she wasn't answering him or returning his voicemails. That being said, he had assumed that Tanisha was just mad at him. The reason was that they had gotten into an argument over the phone shortly before her disappearance. Mark explained that he didn't understand why Tanisha stayed in contact with her exes, especially Timothy, who he claimed had been trying to get back together with her. He said that after their fight, when he didn't hear from Tanisha, he assumed that she was ignoring him. So he had decided all he could really do was go on and try to enjoy the rest of his spring break. Detectives looked into Mark's story and it seemed to check out. His cell records showed that he had made a number of calls to Tanisha and there were witnesses who were able to place him on South Padre Island for a large chunk of the time following the disappearance. At this point, investigators didn't really know what to make of any of this. However, they were about to learn something that would point them in a very specific direction. One with implications that absolutely nobody was prepared for. At around 7.45 p.m. on March 16th, so about a day and a half after Tanisha Stewart had last been seen, a firefighter with Houston's Ponderosa Volunteer Fire Department named Robert Logan was on his way home when he received notice of an emergency call that had been made at an apartment complex on the 17,000 block of Red Oak Drive. Robert was not on duty at the time, but he was only like a couple of intersections away, so he radioed in and decided to head over and see what he could do to help. When Robert arrived, he met up with a Harris County police deputy by the last name of Russell. The pair soon learned that some residents at the complex had witnessed a lot of smoke coming from the balcony of one of the units there. Robert and Deputy Russell headed up to the second floor address, apartment 224, and they knocked at the door. Very quickly, they were greeted by the man who lived there. The man looked kind of confused and out of breath, but he wasn't behaving strangely or anything. When the firefighter and officer explained why they were there, he let them in to make sure that everything was okay. The man said that he was pretty sure that he knew what the emergency calls were about. He had been in the middle of making dinner and he had been grilling out on his balcony, but he had gotten a little distracted. By the time he realized this, he had burned a bunch of food and this was probably what his neighbors had been worried about. As Robert and Deputy Russell looked around a bit, everything seemed to add up. There was a smoker and a barbecue out on the balcony as well as what looked like a few pieces of burned chicken along with some aluminum foil in the kitchen. A couple of the pieces were still smoking, but there was no actual fire and there didn't seem to be any danger. As a result, after a few minutes, Robert and Russell decided to leave. As they were on their way out, Robert happened to pass by the man's bathroom where he saw something that caught his eye. In the tub, there was a small amount of water along with what looked like some ribs and a few other pieces of meat that had yet to be cooked. Now, this was definitely unusual, but when Robert asked about it, the man wasn't weird about it. He said that he was just defrosting some larger pieces and had run out of room in his sink. With that, Robert and Deputy Russell went on their way. The men didn't think much of this whole situation until several days later, when they got word of the missing persons investigation that had been launched for Tanisha. When they heard some of the information, they immediately reached out to the investigative team. Around this same time, on the afternoon of March 21st, so six days after Tanisha had last been seen, detectives would receive another call. This one was from Quanell X, that community activist I told you about earlier. He said the police needed to get down to where he was immediately. He told them he was with a person who had just told him a horrifying story. The address that he gave authorities? Well, it was the same apartment complex that Robert Logan and Deputy Russell had been called to a few days earlier. That apartment belonged to Tanisha's ex-boyfriend, Timothy Wayne Shepard. When police arrived at the complex, they were greeted by Quan L. X who explained that Timothy had called him up that afternoon saying that he was in serious trouble. He knew that he was being investigated in connection with Tanisha's disappearance, and he said that he was feeling incredibly nervous. 
After meeting up, at first, Timothy had tried to play it off like he was innocent and that he was afraid simply because he thought police were going to try and pin the crime on him. But the more he continued talking, the more this just clearly wasn't the case. Sensing an opening, Quan L. X began asking him questions about Tanisha's disappearance. The more he pressed him, the more Timothy became visibly emotional. Still, the activist was totally unprepared for what he would learn next. Timothy confessed that after picking Tanisha up from Lois's apartment on the morning of March 15th, they had gone back to his place. While there, they had gotten into an argument over Tanisha's new relationship with Mark. It turned out that Tanisha had fully intended to remove Timothy from her life and that she was ready to move on. The thing was, Timothy wasn't ready to accept that. They got into an argument, he snapped, and he strangled her to death. After the killing, Timothy said that he had taken Tanisha's remains and had put them in a dumpster at a different apartment complex to avoid suspicion. After admitting all of this to Quan L X, Timothy took him to the dumpster in question, where he pointed everything out. He would also take investigators there once they arrived and learn what was going on. But by this point, multiple garbage pickups had already occurred. As disturbing as all of this already was, it quickly became clear that Timothy's story was only a partial confession. The other part of what had happened would be uncovered when detectives found out about the emergency call at the apartment complex that had been responded to on March 16th, particularly when they started speaking to Timothy's neighbors. So, contrary to what Robert Logan and Deputy Russell had been led to believe at the time, Timothy hadn't just been grilling for an hour or two that evening. According to residents, he had been barbecuing and barbecuing and barbecuing at all hours of the day and night for nearly two days straight. Those who knew Timothy in the neighborhood had asked him about this, and he had told them that he was just making a bunch of food for an upcoming wedding. Timothy was actually known around the complex for doing barbecues, but this didn't look like an ordinary cookout. Timothy wasn't cooking. He was burning stuff. And at points, he had left his grill and smoker going so high and so long that flames had nearly reached the roof of his balcony. This is what had prompted those 911 calls. Upon hearing this, detectives got a sinking feeling in their stomachs. Their worst fears would be confirmed when they finally got a warrant to do a thorough inspection of Timothy's apartment. Inside the unit, investigators found evidence of a major cleanup. Various places had fresh coats of white paint, and the tub in the bathroom had been meticulously scrubbed with cleaning products. Even so, there was plenty of evidence of what had happened there. In Timothy's kitchen sink trap and garbage disposal, authorities recovered dozens of pieces of what was believed to be human bone, along with remnants of teeth, human hair, and, quote, charred items. Hair was also found trapped and hanging from the floorboards of Timothy's balcony, right near where his now missing grill and smoker had been. It would later be revealed in court that after Timothy had killed Tanisha, he had gone to a local hardware store where he had purchased a jigsaw. He then spent the next couple of days systematically breaking down her body and burning the pieces on his grill and smoker so that they would be unrecognizable if they were ever found. He had put some of the remains down his sink through the garbage disposal, but others he had abandoned in that dumpster where he had taken Quan L X. He had also later thrown out the grill and smoker he had used. Due to the fact that there were only two specks of blood ever found in Timothy's bathroom, police could never prove that he was in the middle of doing all of this when Robert and Deputy Russell had come to his house, though it's widely believed that what they saw in Timothy's bathtub that evening were pieces of Tanisha's body which Timothy simply hadn't gotten around to barbecuing yet. Some sources we came across have taken this a step further and have suggested that Timothy either gave some of the remains to unwitting people as food or else consumed parts himself. However, there's really no solid evidence for this as far as we can tell. In fact, according to statements from some of Timothy's neighbors, at least a couple of people who inquired about what he was doing had asked if they could have some when he was finished, obviously not realizing what it was, but he apparently declined. When the case went to trial, Timothy admitted to killing Tanisha, but claimed that he had only done so after she attacked him first. 
He stated that during their argument, she had picked up a knife and swung at him, nicking one of his fingers. He said that after that, he sort of blacked out, and when he came to, Tanisha was dead. Worried that no one would believe his story, he said he panicked and began trying to cover up what had happened. He came out of my house. He talked for a while. He was to about the guys we talked about. That name Mark. She was saying that, which is funny. I said, I want to give credit on the speech voice. She was like, I ain't got to. That's why everything played out. If you like that, I would get to what happened. So after you dropped in the garbage dumpster, what did you do after that? I started cooking. The jury did not buy Timothy's explanation, especially once they heard from some of the people close to Tanisha who described his previous physical and emotional abuse of her during their relationship. Though none of them had realized the full extent of this, Timothy had been possessive and violent with her for a long time leading up to the murder. In fact, in a horrible bit of foreshadowing, Tanisha had even mentioned to one of her roommates at school that the only thing she was nervous for about spring break was the prospect of seeing Timothy again. She worried that he might follow her around. In October of 2008, Timothy Shepard was convicted of Tanisha's murder. He was sentenced to 99 years in prison and was also slapped with a $10,000 fine. At the time of this recording, he remains incarcerated at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice's Memorial Unit. As you might imagine, the truth about what had happened to Tanisha Stewart came as a gut-wrenching blow to her family, particularly to her mother, Gail, who had once thought that Timothy was a nice guy. In an interview we came across, Tanisha's sister, Gayla, said that she not only blames Timothy for her sister's death, but also their mother's. Sadly, Gail Shields passed away just four years after Tanisha in 2011. Gayla stated that she died of a broken heart. While this is definitely believable and extremely tragic, there's another story in here that I think is worth bringing attention to as well. And that's what Gail chose to do with her final years before her death. In the aftermath of her daughter's murder, she devoted a substantial amount of her time to speaking out about domestic violence, specifically taking part in community outreach events and programs where she talked about the importance of recognizing the signs that someone in your life might be in danger. Her hope was that by helping others to see the red flags that she missed, she might be able to prevent further tragedy and loss. In that spirit, one of the things I really thought was worth highlighting was something Gail touched on in an article that was written about the situation at the time in the Houston Chronicle. In it, she talked about how you shouldn't assume that just because someone seems like they're really strong, that they can't be the victims of abuse like this. She said Tanisha was a really strong-willed and outspoken person, but when it came to what she was experiencing, they were in the dark. In some ways, it was almost like this different part of her was living a separate life. All that being said, Gail and the rest of Tanisha's loved ones were careful to point out that they wanted Tanisha to be remembered for how she lived, not the awful way in which she died. To that end, they set up a scholarship in her name at her former high school, one designed to help ambitious young girls who planned to follow in her footsteps. At the time, Gail hoped that one day, Timothy's own daughter might even be able to benefit from Tanisha's legacy. She stated, quote, Timothy has a five-year-old daughter, and when she goes to apply for college money, she's going to see the Tanisha Stewart Scholarship. Tanisha will not be forgotten. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. 
All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.